Thank you. The final item of business is a member's business debate on motion 11849 in the name of David Stewart on the impact of leaving Euratom. The debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Can I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on David Stewart to open the debate. Mr Stewart, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Could I thank all members for staying behind tonight to support this motion uh, and for signing my motion as well? Uh, and those who have not yet signed, I, of course, always welcome sinners who repent. Um, on the uh, surface, President Officer, this debate may seem like a surrogate for another round of Brexit speeches, plus a seminar on an arcane institution, Euratom, or a poor man's lecture on nuclear physics. Um, however, I'm sorry if any member hears and any false pretenses. Uh, the issue this evening is very simple. The future treatment and care of cancer patients and the security of supply of radioisotopes. Uh, notwithstanding my opening statement, President Officer, let me attempt to set the context of the problem. The UK joined the European Atomic Energy Community, better known as Euratom, on 1st of January 1973. Uh, the UK gave notice to leave Euratom as part of the Article 50 process. Uh, the European Commission, for their part, are clear. In a recent statement, they said, and I quote, uh, Euratom Treaty will cease to apply to the UK on the 30th of March 2019. So why is this a problem for the health services and cancer patients? Well, Euratom is a crucial and essential vehicle for the management of radioisotopes. As the Euratom Supply Agency mission statement makes clear, their job is to support secure and safe supply and use of medical radioisotopes. Now, members will be aware that medical radioisotopes are used in radiotherapy for treatment of cancer, and in nuclear medicine for both diagnostic work and therapy. The principal radioisotope used worldwide is uh, titanium, and this is derived from a parent element that has a half-life of 66 hours. The element is obtained from a small number of research nuclear reactors, none of whom are located in the UK. The Hinkley Point Nuclear Research Facility, planned for 2027, could produce radio medical isotopes, but the jury is out as when that facility will be completed. So the bulk of the UK supply is from the EU, facilitated by the Euratom supply operation. For example, the HFR reactor in the Netherlands supplies the UK and has a capacity for a third of global demand. However, it's estimated it will cease operations in 2024. So the context is, President Officer, we have a world shortage of medical isotopes. A key provider, Canada, has just ceased production. So the EU is home to four of the top six global producers. Uh, the distance to Australia and South Africa, who are also significant players, mean they are problematic providers. Supply would be limited by the decay of medical isotopes, which would occur during transportation. So the key issue is that isotopes have short half-lives. That means they decay rapidly and cannot be stored. This creates an urgent need for constant, reliable and predictable supply. But of course, this has failed in the past and has created global shortages. So Euratom has a central and crucial leadership role here. They supervise the supply chains. So for example, there was a crisis in 2008 with the closure of the Channel Tunnel. Again in 2015, when industrial action at Cali caused chaos to the transportation of isotopes and caused the cancellation of treatment across the UK. So, I'm arguing today that there's a clear and present danger to the NHS in Scotland and beyond. It's the loss of frictionless borders post-Brexit. This could result in a traumatic failure to deliver medical isotopes on time to cancer patients. As the Royal College of Radiologists have said, and I quote, navigating Brexit is undoubtedly a huge task for ministers, but our access to these vital materials for diagnosing and treating cancer must not be left to slip down the negotiations list. So radioisotopes are essential tools for nuclear medicine, which combine with a drug that guides isotopes to a particular part of the body. The scale of use is immense and invaluable. In the UK, around 700,000 nuclear medical procedures are carried out each year, with approximately 70,000 of those in Scotland. So it's essential in diagnosing coronary disease, detecting the spread of cancer to the bones, and biomedical research, as the British Nuclear Medicine Society said, patients will be poorly served by not having a cheap, plentiful supply 
of technadium, the most commonly used medical isotope. So what are options, presiding officer? Well, first of all, on a very simplistic level, if it ain't broke, why fix it? Stay in your atom. However, the current administration of the UK government means that decision is unlikely. Secondly, we could look at associate status of your atom under two thousand or till 2006 of the treaty. So this gives receptacle rights and special procedures. So the best example is Switzerland, who joined in 2014. That gives access to funding for nuclear research. Or thirdly, we could have third country status under Article 101 of the treaty. So UK could join USA, Australia and Canada. The advantage there is we have common research on a shared cost basis. And more technically, and I apologise for the technology design officer, we could create more cyclotrons in Scotland. This is not from the more recent Doctor Who film, but it's actually a facility, a linear accelerator, which produces radioisotopes for PET and CT scanners. PET scanners being positron emission tomography. So there are three in Scotland, in Glasgow, Edinburgh and Aberdeen, but no spare capacity to the other PET scanner in Dundee. And of course, when I'm on my feet, I must campaign for a PET scanner in the Highlands, where Highlands spends 300,000 scans alone. However, in my view, a large-scale switch is expensive and probably unlikely. And fifthly, what about waiting for Hinkley Point C to be up and running in 2027? Well, the big question said earlier, will it be on time? What will its capacity be? And we still need to organise the supply chain management. During the House of Commons withdrawal bill debates, many MPs made telling contributions that if we withdraw from the CLAMP, the Euratom Supply Agency, during a global shortage of measurable isotopes, why then should the club care for us? As the old saying from Capitol Hill goes, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And you do not need the predictive powers of the brand seer, who incidentally predicted the Second World War from the 17th century, to divine the future in this area. We have a global shortage of radioisotopes, we produce none of our own, and we're leaving the market that produces the majority of the world's supply. This is not an obscure academic debate, but will influence the quality and quantity of life for cancer patients in the UK now and in the future. As Jimmy Dean once said, I can't change the direction of the wind, but I can adjust my sails to always reach my destination. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Emma Harper to be followed by Donald Cameron. Ms Harper, please. Thank you, presiding officer. I'd like to start by congratulating Dave Stewart on bringing this extremely important debate to the chamber this evening. In his opening remarks, David Stewart has clearly outlined the purpose of Euratom and the importance of the agency, which was created in 1957. The Euratom framework has enshrined the regulation and safeguards for the transportation and use of radioactive materials. And it's worth repeating, as the agency has been established for over 60 years. Brexit poses a threat to Scotland's access to the international pool of research knowledge, skills and expertise on the subject of nuclear energy and medicine. And for our nuclear industry, rapid withdrawal from the Euratom spells disaster. Many experts in the field of nuclear energy, including the British Nuclear Energy Society, have suggested that following the UK's departure from Euratom, many power stations across the country may not be able to source nuclear fuel such as uranium-235 or plutonium-239. So if the UK doesn't have an agree agreement, we won't have the necessary isotope material to provide our services for our patients. Given my health background, I'd like to focus my speech on the health implications of leaving Euratom. The shipment and stock of radioactive medical isotopes used for X-rays and MRI scans and PET scanners, as Dave Stewart has mentioned, it's, it's really necessary to provide cancer treatment for a certain patient population, and I see it's under threat. The means that there may be significant delays to patients who are looking to access life-saving medical treatments in a timely manner may lead to premature and unnecessary deaths. Presiding officer, earlier this year my colleague Dr Philippa Whitford spoke in the House of Commons debate on this subject. She has first-hand knowledge of medical isotopes as a breast surgeon herself and I'd like to echo what she said and I quote, the Royal College of Radiologists are concerned that an inability easily to bring isotopes into the country could affect half a million scans and 10,000 cancer treatments. Isotopes cannot be stored because they have a short half-life, so we do need Euratom. These are not 
pharmaceutical medicines that can be stockpiled, as has been suggested by other medicines. The scans and treatments which Dr Whitford is referring to, and in many cases, they will have saved lives. As many will further be aware, medical isotopes are very particular products and their transportation must be carried out safely and in line with international guidelines. An alternative to these are limited. In a letter on the 6th of September 2018, the president of the British Nuclear Medicine Society, John Buscombe, indicated that in addition to the potential logistical issues with transportation and supply of radiopharmaceutical products, including medical isotopes, the cost of importation and customs clearance is also likely to significantly increase. And in the same letter, President Buscombe urges local health boards across the UK to make pre uh, preparations for this increase in cost, which I find extremely concerning. So I'd like to ask the Scottish Government what it can do to support our NHS health boards to address these challenges of leaving Euratom. This is a 60-year-old treaty to support safety and supply of much-needed medical isotopes. These isotopes are saving lives, and I think it's really important that we bring this to attention to the Chamber today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I call Donald Cameron, who followed by Lewis MacDonald. Mr Cameron, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I too welcome the opportunity to debate this important matter. And I thank David Stewart for allowing us to have this discussion uh, here tonight. I can't pretend to match his scientific expertise, but Brian Whittle has a chemistry degree, I'm told, so please save your questions for him. Um, I also promise not to do a standard Brexit speech, not least given the very serious implications this has for cancer patients. Um, I don't represent the UK government, but I do feel it's only fair to put their position forward to the chamber. Um, a significant amount of discussion has already taken place at UK level on the matter of our membership of Euratom. And I do believe that this is an issue which on all sides, whether you voted to leave or to remain, there is some consensus. The Prime Minister stated in a speech in May that she wants the UK to have a deep science partnership with the EU and that the UK would like the option to fully associate ourselves with the excellent based uh, European science and innovation programs, including, and she quoted, the successor to Horizon 2020 and Euratom R&T. Uh, last year, the Secretary of State for Business, Greg Clark, said that it is the government's ambition to maintain as many benefits as possible through a close association with Euratom in the future. Um, and it's been recognized that the need to protect the progress that has been made over the years, the significant progress over the years between the UK and the EU in respect to nuclear research uh, and uh, nuclear decommissioning expertise, for example, um, and that Brexit must not hinder this in the future. And part of the Chequers proposal does include continued cooperation and information sharing uh, with the European Observatory on the supply of medical radioisotopes. And I would say that the UK government has prioritised ensuring a close relationship uh, with Euratom exists after we leave the EU. Now, while I recognise that much of David Stewart's motion relates to radioisotopes, um, there are some, I think, important points to make about the passage of the Nuclear Safeguards Act in 2018, uh, which is an important aspect of all this uh, for several reasons. Firstly, it allows the UK government to make regulations for and implement uh, international agreements in relation to nuclear safeguarding, which will be required once the UK leaves Euratom. It allows existing legislation to be amended by regulation in relation to withdrawal, and it extends the bill to the whole of the UK. And ultimately, I believe that it will allow for continuity. But on the main issue relating to medical radioisotopes, uh, there have been assurances that leaving Euratom will not affect the UK's ability to import medical radioisotopes. Uh, and in a paper published by the Department for Business, um, it does note that the Euratom Treaty refers to medical radioisotopes and the prohibition of custom duties, etc. And these references do not set any restrictions or limitations on trade in such materials with countries outside the U EU. So I would submit, Deputy Presiding Officer, there is nothing in the Euratom Treaty impeding the UK's ability to continue to access medical radioisotopes from the EU when the UK is no longer a member state. And the UK's ability to import medical radioisotopes will not be affected by a withdrawal from Euratom. Of course. 
Emma Harper. Cameron. Um, there are issues around the uh, Euratom Treaty, which means that there's a free flow of movement of scientists. So is that part of the red line that Theresa May has where we're not going to allow migration of workers because that would impede the ability to continue with research in Euratom? Donald Cameron. Well, I, I don't accept that. And I, I'm, I'm not going to um, get stuck into a, a debate about migration. Um, but I would say that you know, there's been a very clear commitment to um, EU um, citizens, um, even in the event of no deal. So I think that the UK government has made their position more than clear. But just to conclude, Deputy Presiding Officer, um, I welcome this opportunity to have a debate. Leaving the EU is clearly one of the, you know, the most important political moments of our lifetime. And it's right that we have a frank debate about it. But I would say that it's in the interest of the UK and the EU to ensure that the trade of medical radioisotopes is as frictionless as possible for the benefit of patients here in Scotland. And after all, they are the people that we must keep in mind more than anyone. And I hope that given significant forward planning has taken place, that will, allow, that, that will be realised in the months and years ahead. Thank you. Thank you. I call Lewis MacDonald, be followed by Brian Whittle. Mr Whittle will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr. Thank McDonald, you very much, please. President Officer. And I too congratulate David Stewart on bringing this debate on a very important topic which was highlighted in a report from the Health and Sport Committee earlier this year. I'm pleased to support this debate there for us, convener of the committee, also because of the important role that my home city of Aberdeen has played in the field of medical physics. Members will know that credit for the invention and development of magnetic resonance imaging and of PET scanners belongs to pioneers like the late Jim Hutchison and John Mallard at Forrester Hill. Aberdeen Royal Infirmary is also uh, today one of the several centres of nuclear medicine in Scotland cities which provide vital diagnostic and treatment tools for cancer patients in particular. The delivery of those services depends on nuclear physicists, on radiologists and on radiographers, all in their different ways, highly skilled and high value staff, some of whom are sadly in short supply, not just in Aberdeen but across the Scottish NHS. In addition, hospitals like ARI have radio pharmacies which are responsible for procuring the isotopes and managing the radioactive material so essential to these medical uses. Those pharmacy specialists are also much to be commended for their essential contribution and the good relationships they have built up with the manufacturers of the isotopes in Europe and further afield have played an important role in ensuring the reliability of supply on which patients depend. That said, this is by definition not a perfect market or even a medically focused business model. The suppliers of radioisotopes did not go into business to meet medical need. Their core business is typically military or civil nuclear power generation or related research. So it is a credit to all concerned that what is essentially a byproduct uh, from other much larger business activities has become so valuable in its own right uh, to the point where Britain leaving the European Atomic Energy Community carries such significant risks for medical treatment. Now, the reason for the British government giving separate notice of the UK's intention to leave Euratom as part of the Brexit process is simply that the members of the European Union are signatories of the relevant treaty. But as both David Stewart and Emma Harper uh, mentioned, it is technically separate uh, from the EU itself. There is therefore nothing to prevent UK ministers from seeking to protect the many benefits of Euratom membership including access to radioisotopes as part of the wider negotiations on our future relationship with the European Union. That, of course, depends on ministers putting forward serious and credible proposals for that relationship across the board, in particular around the terms of trade for the avoidance of tariff and other barriers between the United Kingdom and the European Union. And the prospects for that clearly remain to be seen. As has been said, the commissioning of Hinkley Point C, perhaps in 2027, will resolve these critical supply issues at that time. But that is no consolation to those who need access to radioisotopes in the next few years. Supply from EU countries like France, Belgium and the Netherlands, which has been mentioned, remains essential. And securing that supply well into the 2020s has to be a high priority for the UK government. If UK ministers are able to address these issues in the next few weeks or months, the negotiating position is strengthened by the fact that European countries rely on being able to import 
radio ligands which are manufactured in the UK by GE Healthcare. But if ministers do not solve this problem, not only will patients here lose out, but there must be a risk that GE Healthcare ultimately choose to re relocate that high value, high business, uh, uh, high technology business to somewhere else in the European Union. There is then a lot of stake in economic terms as well as in health terms. And the UK government must go forward and do everything it can to resolve this issue as early as possible for all our stakes. Thank you. Thank you. I call Brian Whittle. Um, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I can also thank David Stewart for bringing this debate uh, to the Chamber. I think in the maelstrom that currently consumes uh, British and Scottish politics uh, with Brexit and the continued constitutional bun fight, I think today's debate should, be a, should allow us the opportunity to have a much needed balanced and informed debate on the potential fallout, if you'll excuse the pun, or otherwise that, that Brexit may bring. It also serves to highlight the importance of the negotiations currently underway and what our role could and should be in ensuring important issues such as today's topic are not allowed to fall through the cracks. And, and I was going to intervene in a couple of speeches there, but uh, I don't want to, to undervalue or uh, underestimate the need uh, in establishing this, this movement of, of uh, isotopes uh, uh, across our borders. But, but I did want to note that uh, um, there are those, although there are those isotopes that have a very short half-life, which, which um, uh, David Stewart has mentioned, there are those that have a very long half-life that we currently use. Like, uh, I'm, I've scribbled down here um, strontium-90, which is 30 years, and cobalt-60, which is five years, and iridium-74 days, which, which are also used within that process. So I think it's important that we have this debate to make sure that we, we, we stay uh, uh, factual, but that, that is not to underestimate the need for those with that, that very short uh, half-life. So uh, Euroatom has that responsibility for establishing that single market for trade in nuclear materials and technology ac across the EU. And um, uh, acknowledging it provides that key role in facilitating a secure and constant supply of radioisotopes that are used across a range of sectors, including medical, industrial, and scientific fields. So as my, my, my colleague Donald Cameron has said, uh, uh, looking at the response uh, from the, the UK government I think the, the, uh, it is welcome that they seek to continue to support this organisation and, and, and seek that continuity of cooperation and standards. And I think this includes the wish to maintain the UK's mutual successful civil nuclear cooperation uh, within the European Union. I think uh, that that is, 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 is good news indeed. And that whole intention has been outlined very clearly in the industrial st mm -hmm. strategy to support the scientific community and, and to build as much support for it as, as we can after we leave uh, the European Union. I think uh, uh, when we discuss medical isotopes, I think contrary to what has been in some reports, medical radioisotopes are not classed as special fissile material and therefore not subject to the same uh, nuclear safeguards. So the, the UK's ability to import medical isotopes from Europe and the rest of the world shouldn't uh, be affected. I think also, uh, I also want to... Uh, uh, of course, David I was uh, very reluctant to argue with uh, people with degrees in industrial chemistry, um, but I do have a letter from the European Commission because I knew this issue would, would come up. They make it quite clear that uh, radioisotopes, as in the case of other goods, are covered by the treaty on the functioning of the European Union concerning the single market. What that means is that their import or export are still subject to customs procedures or regulatory threats. So, irrespective of the Euratom issue, who are the main supply agency, the Commission does have a vital role over import and export and do have a locus in this area. Brian Whittle. Uh, can, I, can I thank David Stewart for that intervention? And he, of course, I, I'm not, I'm not going to argue that. What I was uh, merely pointing out that it's, it's not classed as special fissile material, so it can, it can actually uh, be imported uh, from around the world and from Europe uh, just the same, I think. I also wanted to have a look at the, the BMA's uh, view on this, uh, and it's, of course it's suggesting that the UK government should negotiate a formal agreement with Euratom. Uh, uh, similar to the ones that are in place with non-EU uh, countries such as Switzerland. So there is a precedence uh, already set for collaborative working uh, with countries uh, outside of the EU. Uh, from the UK, I think negotiating a formal agreement with the uh, Euroatom would ensure consistent and timely access to radioisotopes for medical purposes and facilitate close collaboration on radiation research and support. 
From the EU's perspective, though, negotiating a formal agreement with the UK would underpin uh, continued collaboration with UK nuclear research institutions and facilitate that continued access to UK data which supports EU involvement in research projects. However, if it failed uh, uh, to make an agreement, a withdrawal agreement by March 2019, the UK would have to operate outside of the Euroatom, which has already been, uh, been reported, and, and source radioisotopes from outside of this framework, which I agree would be problematic. But we must also remember that this would close off a market for those countries who supply such, project, uh, such project, uh, products. And the UK, mark, uh, the UK market is a major market. Uh, in the longer term, I think it would it restrict uh, the ability of the UK and the UK to benefit from sharing expertise in radiation research, radiation protection, and the disposal of radioactive waste. And if I could finish, in the blizzard of, of political posturing that surrounds Brexit, I do th also think we have a responsibility to ensure uh, uh, issues such as our relationship with Euratom remain high on the agenda in those Brexit negotiations. And I would prefer that we do this in a public forum to inform public of the work that's being done, but I do understand why political parties may be reluctant to act on these issues in public. So I'd ask at the very least, we as a parliament do so uh, uh, behind closed doors. So I close Deputy Presiding, by Presiding Officer by once again thanking Dave Stewart for giving us the opportunity to keep Euroatom on the agenda. Thank you. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to close for the government. Minister, please. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, can I join others in congratulating Dave Stewart on securing this important debate tonight. In 2016, 62% of voters in Scotland indicated their wish to remain within the European Union. Despite the clear and decisive wishes of the Scottish people, the UK government has pressed ahead regardless of its intention to take the whole of the UK out of the EU. The Scottish Government has demonstrated in our analysis of Scotland's place in Europe that staying in the EU is the best option for Scotland's future. Failing that, our analysis shows that continued membership of the European Single Market and Customs Union is essential for our economy, our society and our people. And it was good, I think, that Lewis MacDonald brought in the economy into, into today's um, discussion. The potential consequences of leaving the EU are far-reaching and damaging, and it's only as the negotiations progress and become more complex that everyone can see just what is at stake. And we must ensure that the Scottish voice is heard throughout negotiations and that we continue to push to give real and meaningful input into the negotiations. Last week, the First Minister called on the UK Government to seek an extension to the Article 50 negotiations and to reconsider our proposal to remain in the single market and the customs union in order to mitigate the worst damage of Brexit. It's crucial that the UK Government ensures that there are robust contingency plans in place to safeguard an uninterrupted supply of medicines and medical products, including medical isotopes that are sourced from the EU. Many of the practical issues related to medical isotopes supply, such as entry and customs control, are outside the Scottish Government's control. However, we continue to, to, to press the Department of Health to cooperate and to fully engage with us around the Brexit pre preparation plans. Members can be assured that we are preparing for all eventualities related to EU withdrawal. Officials have been working closely with NHS Scotland boards over the past months to mitigate the risks and potential implications where possible. NHS boards are taking forward their own planning for Brexit and I can assure Emma Harper that we are supporting them in this work within the context of a fluid and rapidly developing situation. All boards have consistently identified concerns relating to the obvious workforce issues. They've also identified issues around medicines, medical isotopes, medical devices, clinical trials, access to future EU funding, and the right of Scottish citizens to access state-provided healthcare across the EU. In August this year, the UK number government announced plans to secure supplies of medicines, medical devices, and clinical consumables in the case of a no Brexit deal. This included intent to stockpile medicines which may be impacted by delays at the UK border to ensure there was an additional six week supply. And officials are currently working with the Department of Health on this issue and are discussing preparedness plans with NHS Scotland. Um, Enna Harper outlined the medical uses of medical isotopes. Um, those used for the diagnosis and treatment of diseases such as cancer are all made out with the, the EU. And as Dave Stewart um, said, these products cannot be stockpiled because they rapidly decay. 
obviously, um, Mr Whittle, with his um, um, industry experience, was able to highlight one or two which, which don't rapidly de decay. But many of these isotopes have um, uh, fast half-lives and rapidly de decay. So it's critical that they reach hospitals as soon as possible and are not held up um, by customs delays. The UK's membership of the European Union is inextricably, inextricably linked to membership of Euratom, the European Economic Energy Club. And while it is possible perhaps to have some sort of other arrangement, clearly it is better to be part of such a club than to be a bystander. So in leaving the EU and by extension Euratom, the UK government risks the future production and supply of medical isotopes to the whole of the UK. Indeed. David and Stewart. And probably it's the first time I can say I actually agree with every word that the Minister has said in his, his contribution. Um, ha has the Scottish Government looked at doing a contingency plan for the potential shortages in the future? For example, using Healthcare Improvement Scotland to do analysis of this. And the other point I was making about cyclotrons are important because we do have control over that. Uh, your own city of Dundee doesn't have the actual raw material needed. Um, could I put a plea in for looking at decentralising that, particularly in Rigmore and Inverness, there's a real need for this. Minister. I, I think as the, as the clarity of, of um, the implications of Brexit um, become clearer, um, clearly we need to look at, at all the options to make sure we can try to mitigate um, what is a, um, a really bad situation. Um, and it is a bad situation. So in contrast to the rosy picture painted by Donald Cameron and Brian Whittle, there are significant concerns by stakeholders such as the British Nuclear Medicines Society and the British Medical Association. There remains considerable uncertainty. And as such, we are clear that the UK government is playing with the lives of those people in Scotland and indeed those in the rest of the United Kingdom who depend upon these life-saving products, of course. Brian Whittle. Uh, can, uh, can I thank the member for taking the intervention just to clarify? Uh, in no way was I trying to pick, uh, <laughs> pitch a rosy picture. Um, as as a, an ardent uh, uh, um, Remainer and one of the 62% the, the in Scotland, as you say, uh, or the 48% in the UK, as you say, um, well, what I was trying to do was to say that within this environment that we have, it is massively important that, yes, we're making political points and political statements here, but in this particular debate, I think it's massively important that we get the opportunity to continually raise these issues and keep them on the agenda. Minister. The, the member, member is correct, um, but there are many risks that um, are associated with Brexit, and many of those areas are reserved areas um, of the UK government, which makes it difficult for us. It is, is, is important, as the member said, and as um, Mr Stewart obviously brought this to the chamber, it is important that we have these discussions, um, but there are huge risks around supply of medicines, mes medical isotopes and medical devices. If the UK government persists with their position on leaving the single market and the customs union, then they do so knowing the harm that they, could in in they can do to our invaluable NHS. We're clear that all people living in Scotland, including those who have to deal with a life-changing diagnosis, deserve clarity and reassurance from the UK government, particularly that supplies of critical medical products, such as isotopes used in their diagnosis and treatment of diseases such as cancer, will not be disrupt disrupted. Members can be assured that we will continue to push the UK government for those, insur those assurances. Um, Presiding officer, Scotland did not vote for Brexit. As um, the potential consequences become clearer by the day, it is time for the UK government to wake up and start working to retain Scotland and the UK's place in the single market and customs union and keep us in Euratom. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the debate and I close this meeting.